building the suspense. <laughs> hey guys, how are you doing? Um, thanks for tuning into the podcast today. I have the co-founder and CEO of Bitcoin Reserve, um, Nick Orojewski. Sorry, Nick, how do we pronounce your surname? No, that's quite all right. Uh, Orojewski, it's, it's a bit of a difficult tongue twister. <laughs> Yeah, I, don't, I, just, I had it open there, but I totally lost the tab um, to pronounce it. But yeah, it's originally Russian, is, is that correct? Yeah, that's right. I, I was born in Russia. Um, I moved out when I was about five years old, and I don't really consider myself a Russian at heart. Uh, I spent most of my time living in the United States and Canada. So Yeah, cool. Um, looking forward to hearing. So yeah, like if, if you want to just jump into, say, your, I suppose, your background, Bitcoin origin story, um, I'd l- love to hear it. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, backgrounds economics and finance. Uh, I got involved in Bitcoin in late 2012. Originally, I was in it for the money aspect of it. Um, when I first got started, I was already trading uh, options, futures, equities, uh, Forex quite extensively at that time. And when Bitcoin came on the scene, I was really impressed by the level of information that I had access to. So, for example, if you're trading equities, you know, you most certainly, at least at a professional level, you need the Bloomberg terminal. Now with the Bloomberg terminal, your costs are pretty substantial per month in order to get access to level two data. So level two data, uh, effectively the, the order books and being able to see what orders are placed at what particular level um, and looking at the order flow as well. However, with the systems that were put in place with Bitcoin, particularly Mt. Gox at the time, all that information was readily available without any extra payments required. So for me, I was like, hey, you know, this this could be an opportunity for me to get a bit of an edge. Uh, and so I started dabbling into trading in Bitcoin. And uh, I will admit other currencies, <laughs> other shit coins at that time as well. Uh, I'm sure we all have part of that history. Um, then obviously we, we move past it and we learn. But at that time, that was my primary focus. You know, I didn't really understand too much about the technology itself and the revolution that came along with it. Uh, so I did that for about two years. And after that, you know, kind of my friend came back to me and he said, you know, you should really take a look, a deep look at the white paper. So I read the white paper by Satoshi and that's when things started to click with me. I had a couple of conversations with my friend and I realized, wait a second, you know, this is a completely new paradigm for what money can actually be in the way that it's secured, in the way that it can be moved. And of course the, the, the elimination of any kind of counterparties in the transactions uh, that would be involved on the network. And that being tied to the security mechanism, which is proof of work and how energy consumption fit into that, I started to understand that this was almost a way to be able to use electricity as money. And it's a bit of a different take than some people have. I can go into this a a bit later if that's something that you're interested in. But at that time, I decided, wait a second, okay, this, this is deeper than just trading and being able to make money. This has the potential to be an economic and a social revolution and something that could really help humanity long-term. At that point in time, I decided, okay, you know what, <clears throat> screw it. I'm, I'm going to go into this full-time and this is going to be the area of my life and, and business that I want to pursue for the long run. So I looked around, uh, I visited a lot of different meetups and events. You know, at that time it was a very small community. So there wasn't too, too many events going on, but I recall when I went to Las Vegas at one of the meetups that were being hosted there. And I met a gentleman by the name of Paul Pui, who is the CEO of Airbits, now Edge Security. We got talking and that ended up to be my first job. I worked as an analyst with them for a bit. And I think it was now in 2014 that I had stayed with the company for about a year. And I decided to move on and look into a bit more of things that kind of fit my area of expertise. Again, having traded for a long time, I really understood how exchanges functioned and what purpose they served. So I started a Bitcoin exchange, uh, or I shouldn't say I started, I wasn't the co-founder. I was the CEO of a Bitcoin exchange alongside with uh, Yuri, who's my current co-founder actually at Bitcoin Reserve. And we grew that company to be the second largest Bitcoin exchange in Canada by volume which is not saying much at the time, 
but it was really interesting environment for me to learn how things functioned from the legacy side of the business, not just from the Bitcoin or quote unquote kind of crypto sphere. There worked on the company for about a year or so and ended up subsequently leaving that project. The reason being is because the regulatory environment in Canada at that time was not very clear. Um, there was a, a chance meeting that we had with our KYC ML officer and she effectively informed us that, hey guys, you know, what you're doing right now, even though you're collecting KYC, you're doing all of the things that you should be doing. We can't guarantee, and the government can't guarantee that all of these things will completely turn on a dime. And effectively, what you're going to be doing here will not be considered legal anymore. And you know, we're looking at this as as younger individuals, and there's no DNO insurance, directors and officers insurance. So we said, okay, that's way too much risk, personal risk, and personal liability for this. I ended up leaving the company. After that, I got together with a couple of guys out of California that I had met through just my network, and we ended up starting to look for a hedge fund, uh, a location to start up a hedge fund. We did a lot of due diligence from Singapore, Isle of Man, even looked at Africa. We looked at other parts of Europe, and effectively, we ended up setting up Liechtenstein. In Liechtenstein, uh, we started an AIF, which is called an Alternative Investment Fund. There, we did that project up until late 2018. And in 2018, if those who have been around in the space are familiar, was the start of the bear market as a result of what was going on with, the, 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 I believe, as a result of what's going on with the Ethereum ecosystem, which was an interesting and tangled web, to say the least. Uh, the fund was long only due to the regulatory infrastructure of the FMA, which is the regulator over in Liechtenstein. And a long only fund in a bear market is not something <laughs> that is very appealing to investors. So that ended up lasting for all of maybe a year or so. Uh, after that, you know, I kind of sat back and I said, it's okay, all of this time that I've been in this industry, in this space, I, I've been doing a lot of projects that seem to be very dependent on the market dynamics. And I, I, how, I was at a dinner with uh, Yuri at that time, he was just exiting Binary Financial, which was a brokerage firm out of Vancouver. And we got talking. It's like, hey, listen, you know, I'm, I've been around the world at this point in time. I have found out all of the jurisdictions that will be long term viable for building a Bitcoin business. And I'm tired of all the shit coinery. I, I, I don't want to be involved in that. And he was on the same page as me. And he had a book of clients that he was also looking to do something with that were going to go along with him for the next journey that he would take. And so in, let's just call it spring of 2018, we formed Layer 2 Brokers OU, which is now uh, called Bitcoin Reserve. And the name came from the fact that what we really wanted to build was an OTC brokerage, a market agnostic business that would be able to survive both in the bear markets and the bull markets and effectively focus on a Bitcoin only ethos alongside with that in a jurisdiction that would be long-term sustainable and viable, which at that time was Estonia. So we set up the business and we focused on bringing layer two technologies such as Lightning Liquid to the OTC brokerage model. And we've been building that out for, I guess now it would be four years, going on five years. Uh, we've done a lot of different projects and products in the space from integrating Liquid, uh, all the way going into the retail side of the business and TCA and then kind of settled on accessible OTC brokerage because we found a really interesting niche wherein there was an existence of brokers that required high minimums like Cumberland, for example, for users to be able to transact. And then there was a complete opposite side where people were spying like a hundred or $200 worth of Bitcoin, which would be companies like Relay, Swan and things like that. So we found kind of a nice middle spot there and accessible OTC was born. So that's kind of my, my quick background there. That's super interesting. Um, thanks for that insight. So, yeah, so Canada then. So you, I heard correctly that you had uh, like a Bitcoin exchange um, in Canada before. This, so this has gone back, what, seven or eight years? Yeah. Okay, okay. And at the time, so like at the time, then the regulatory environment was you, you basically got told it was a total, you know, it was too risky. Um did it, did it kind of turn out okay in Canada in the end? Or because I, I I saw some stuff. No, I'm definitely not an expert. 
any means by regulation in Canada, but I know it's gone quite, I think it's gone quite hostile again lately. Would that be correct? Yeah, that definitely would be a correct um, analysis of the space. I think Quadrica, which was one of the exchanges that blew up pretty spectacularly in that jurisdiction, didn't do regulators or clients or people who believed in that any favors. And as a result, the way that the regulatory structure started to shift was effectively every business that would be involved in this type of industry had to get the same type of regulatory, was under the same type of regulatory framework as a bank itself. So that brings a lot of requirements and back office complexities to the business, which a lot of businesses that are rather small, you know, in comparison to a bank, when you're talking about uh, Bitcoin exchanges, it's just very difficult to comply. And now we're kind of seeing the spillover of what's going on with FTX starting to come into Canada as well. And by that, I mean, people having a very negative view on these types of businesses. So I wouldn't necessarily say it's hostile. I would just say that the requirements, the requirements are continuing to increase and the cost for upholding those requirements are also starting to skyrocket. So it's pushing smaller businesses out of the space. Yeah, I saw something like even Canadian citizens can only transact like up to, is it like $20,000 in non-Bitcoin cryptocurrencies, which ironically is maybe kind of a good thing. <laughs> but is that correct? Yeah, it's, 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 it's a good little limit to place, I guess, in some respects. Um, what I've also seen is there has been other moves from companies that are based internationally. So, for example, Bitfinex that are now no longer taking, well, perhaps this is a bit early to say, but uh, I'm privy to some information wherein Canadian clients are not going to be able to trade on Bitfinex probably by the end of Q1 of this year. So there's a lot of issues, you know, with accepting Canadian clients if you're an international business. And locally, like I said, in order to be able to do that, you're met with these restrictions, these caps, and alongside of it, very onerous reporting requirements that completely break the kind of confidentiality agreement that one would like to have to see with their counterparty for trading when it comes to the sharing of their personal information, financial information, trading information, and that kind of stuff. So, yeah, so the story with like Quadriga, it is it's Quadriga, that's how you pronounce it. Yeah. Yep. It wasn't the, the founder was supposed to have died or something, and then all the Bitcoins <laughs> went under. But didn't the Bitcoins move very recently again or something? So that's a very interesting tale. Um, I will preface it and say that the Bitcoin and again, crypto community in Canada and particularly in the West Coast of Canada, BC is very small. So we were able to meet with all of these people and kind of get to know them as individuals. And it's very clear that the company originally as it was built was not there to function as an exchange. Um, it was there to function more as an operation for moving money from one place to another. If you look at the BBC documentary, if you look at some of the other resources that are available online, the original co-founder, uh, he goes by the name of Michael Patron. His real name is Omar Danani. He was a convict out of California that uh, dealt a lot with uh, the Bitgold and eGold ecosystem, moving large amounts of money for the Russian mob. Of all people, he got arrested and... Uh, made his way up to Canada, eventually ended up uh, meeting Jerry, who is the official CEO on paper to the company. But in, in the background there, it was some pretty shady dealings. So I'm not surprised that it went the way that it did. And I do believe that the funds themselves don't even exist in nearly the amounts that people wish that they did. And the reason being is because both of the individuals had, and you know, Frankly, a lot of people do a gambling addiction. <laughs> so it was this very similar situation to FTX, um, just at a different scale where client funds were used effectively to run speculative investments and speculative operations that eventually did not go their way because they're not professional money managers by any sense. So what has happened to those individuals? You know, we don't know. Um, there's a lot of theories one way or the other. And I don't think we ever will know the full truth, but that's, that's a rabbit hole that, you know, we can go into for quite some time. 
Um, I think for the sake of our call, we could just leave it at that. Well, yeah, it's just I have a friend. I suppose the reason um, I spiked my interest there was I have a friend that uh, is convinced that whoever this guy, because I really don't know anything about this other than like, you know, the headline. Um, he's convinced that like this guy faked his death out in India or something and he's still alive and still holds the money. But like, you know, who knows? So you, so you think that the BBC documentary, because I have heard of that, um, you, you think that's a good like synopsis for the whole thing? Uh, I think it gives a really good history of how it came to be what it is. It's probably missing some things here and there because a lot of the investigative elements of it are still under seal by the RCMP, which are probably not going to be released for some time. Um, but if you want to get a good kind of overview, yeah, the BBC documentary would be a good place to turn. Okay, that's good. Because, you know, I'm just never sure with those things, like, especially, you know, is it just propaganda, like, <laughs> if it's made by, like, someone like that. But, uh, yeah, okay, that's good to know. So put that on the list. And just on Canada in general, then, like, I've always thought, like, you said the community, did you say Western Vancouver is, is quite small? Like, I've yeah. always thought that, especially on Twitter, um, just the Bitcoin companies in general, there seems to be an outsized Canadian, like there seems to be a lot of Canadian, you know, Bitcoin, whatever, if you want to call them influencers, like Twitter personalities. Is there any reason for that? Like, it just seems that there's more than there should be like across all yeah. of Canada. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a good question. Uh, I think Canada in general is pretty overrepresented when it comes to the people that are in the space who call themselves Bitcoiners or part of the crypto ecosystem. And the reason being, and not too many people know this about Canada and particularly Western Canada, it's actually one of the money laundering capitals of North America. So a lot of Chinese capital flows in there. There's a lot of regulatory arbitrage that goes on with people trying to move their money out of the country. And this has been going on before Bitcoin. This is not something that just started as a result of uh, the, the creation of the Bitcoin blockchain. Uh, effectively, Chinese people are limited to 50,000 USD that they can move outside of the country. And through the use of shadow banking systems and in coordination with casinos, which, by the way, you can find all of this information you know, online and, and available in various news resources, they take their money and they move it into Canadian real estate. And on top of that, they start to dabble into private equity. There's a lot of speculative investments that go on in the junior minor space. So British Columbia is a very resource niche, resource rich province. And a lot of these schemes garner investments from outside capital and foreign capital. So that kind of built the base of this kind of activity. And when Bitcoin came on the scene, frankly, it was just a lot easier to do business in Canada because you didn't have to certify or have to worry about 50 different states in terms of what regulatory compliance you have to do with them. Canada just kind of, again, at that time, it was a very big gray zone. So you had a lot of early adopters come in, start different businesses and continue to operate them as long as they could. And I think there was a lot of people that were based in the United States that actually had their operations located in Canada. And as a result, this could be one of the reasons why there is an overrepresentation of those people kind of still left in the industry. That's, That's interesting. Yeah. And the, um, well, so you, I suppose what you're saying is the reason Canada got in so early was because of the, the money laundering background when Bitcoin didn't have any KYC or anything associated with it. It was, it was good. Yeah, yeah. There was just a lot of, I think, synergies between the way that the markets functioned and what you would kind of call the unregulated securities aspect of what can be done, particularly not with Bitcoin, actually, but with all of the ICOs, with all the STOs and everything else that started going on in that. So that's really when the industry started to boom in Canada um, as a result of those types of individuals, corporate structures, and just the ease and the greed of the people that are involved in those types of enterprises. Yeah. And like, I assume they're not trying to do like money laundering and stuff with Bitcoin anymore because of all like the, you know, chain analytics and stuff would probably catch up pretty fast. Is yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's, it's funny because the government, you always hear also in the mainstream media say that Bitcoin is the number one tool for money launders. Actually, no, it's cash. Okay. And HSBC uh, and many other banks have been literally caught red handed and fined billions of dollars for their complicity in laundering cartel money and laundering drug money and laundering other various types of 
um, activity. And this is mostly done through cash. So cash is king when it comes to money laundering and Bitcoin at this point in time, and even early on was really not a great vehicle for something like this, because while you could transfer the money from point A to point B uh, without much issue, it's how do you legitimize that money within that jurisdiction? And that's always been the difficult part. And exactly as you say, at that point in time, when it comes to legitimizing it, and by that, I mean, taking it from an, uh, from your wallet to an exchange and from exchange into your bank account, you would have to face the chain analysis of the respective companies that are doing that transaction. And chain analysis, funny enough, I have an a interesting story there. So chain analysis, the company, right? Chain analysis is kind of like a term now, like Kleenex. Uh, but chain analysis is actually one of the big companies that started and did an incubator run in Vancouver. At least one of their devs was present there at the time. And again, because it's a very small space, you get to meet all these individuals. And I recall one day uh, he showed me his interface and it looked like just you know, a web of all of these different connections. They use various heuristics. It's not a 100% trace where they can say exactly this person owns this address, but through meta analysis of transactions, and their associated origins, you can kind of get a feel for where things are going. So anyways, he showed me this, this web. He's like, okay, you know, here are the dark markets, here are the exchanges, here's all of the, the, the other areas of, of, this, of this map. And I was like, you know what? This is really interesting. And this is probably early on, this is maybe 2017, I think, kind of when this thing was really starting to take off. And I asked him, so if you don't mind me asking you, who are you selling this to? Like, what are your clients? He's like, yeah, you know, I'm under an NDA. I can't share too much there, but I'll tell you a lot of three letter agencies. I was like, okay, say no more. I get what you're going with this. So the point in saying that is effectively Bitcoin as a money laundering mechanism is completely ineffective. And it's something that just doesn't really work due to chain analysis and due to the regulatory requirements of actually getting this money into the ecosystem and then using it. <laughs> Do you think just on chain analytics, like I know a lot of people think like, it, well, it is, it's not think it is very powerful at the moment. Do you think that, well, I, I don't know, do you have insight here, but like, do you think that is going to be able to be walked back in the future with like a particular Bitcoin circular economy or, you know, layer yeah. twos, that kind of thing? Uh, and this kind of coincides with, with the regulatory topic and where regulation is heading, but I, am under the impression that we are going to be moving into a very multipolar world when it comes to a Bitcoin only economy and when it comes to a legacy economy. And by that, I mean, you're going to have to, you're going to see a lot of nation states. You're going to lot to see a lot of small communities and private cities utilizing Bitcoin, Bitcoin for internal trade, wherein it doesn't need to hit a legacy ecosystem such as a bank. You can go and you can buy directly, like look at El Salvador, right? You can buy pretty much all goods and services right now in Bitcoin. There's no need to ever go into a legacy infrastructure of a bank or an exchange in order to be able to actually conduct your transactions and your trade. So from that perspective, okay, go ahead, you know, chain analysis, run as much as you want, regulatory issues, you can you know, put as many blacklists and whitelists out there as you want, but that merchant who's selling his fish to you, he's not going to care because he can turn around and go get grain or a fishing gear or a boat or whatever else with that Bitcoin. There's no necessities for that. However, on the flip side, due to the encroaching regulation, and again, due to the power of the chain and chain analysis in certain situations, um, that type of Bitcoin, if you were to then say, go to Europe with it and go ahead and try to buy a house, well, you're not going to be able to, because as soon as you put it on an exchange, or as soon as you take that money from an exchange and move it onto a bank, the bank's going to ask, well, what are your source of funds? Where did that Bitcoin come from? And if the travel rule gets put in place, then you're also going to have to verify all of the interpersonal transactions from a self-hosted wallet from person A to person B before it's even accepted by the bank. The money that you transacted and changed to fiat is ever accepted by the bank and being able to be used. So that kind of forms the secondary economy. So effectively you will have this circulating Bitcoin that really can be labeled in whatever way you want. That's still gonna allow you to transact in these types of instances while you're gonna have the same Bitcoin not allowed in the legacy ecosystem. And then you're going to have different, I, I don't want to use the term colored coins um, because that's, that's not really kind of what it is, but effectively it will be a Bitcoin with a history that needs to be clean in order to be able to actually utilize it. So there, you know, there's an interesting speculative argument to be made for virgin coin 
Bitcoin that comes directly from miners. And that will most likely be what people are looking for if they're looking to transact in the legacy ecosystem with Bitcoin and be able to purchase assets and things like that. While other Bitcoin that have been circulating for a long time uh, would be less viable for that. And I think that's that's a pretty big threat to, to the industry as a whole, but it also provides a lot of opportunity for people and nation states and, and again, small private cities to really be able to jump on this ecosystem and utilize it internally for what Bitcoin was really meant to, which was a form of digital uncensorable cash. Yeah, I think like to your point, like, well, I, I do think that it's extremely important. Um, I think Saifedean was talking about this relatively recently as well as saying that like if Bitcoin, you know, isn't able to be truly function as a private money, maybe at least on some level, like, does it actually break the whole vision? Um, I just think it, it might, it gets too much. It just gets too much to handle. And like, what's going to happen is because they can't just create things out of thin air anymore. Like they can't just create their, you know, they don't have a, a money printer quote unquote. Um, and unless there's a full global, you know, like cause the chain analytics and all that works extremely well. If it works extremely well, if there's a global regulatory environment that is massively coordinated and then it works extremely well, if everyone's using on the circular economy level, um, cause it, like if say like, you know, what Bitcoin exchanges and all that. In a hyper Bitcoinized world, there is no reason to transact. It'd be interesting to get your take on this, but uh, there is no onboarding anymore to KYC. So it all then comes down to it depends on whether in the circular economy it's open source software that is facilitating the payments. Because if it is and there are, it isn't banks, then there is no. Um, there's no exchange, you know, there's, there's no entity to KYC those users. Like when you, when you boot up your, you know, your ledger or your treasure or whatever, as it stands at the moment, and it would be very hard to institute, there is no KYC associated with that. How the KYC is got is from the exchange. And then they, you know, put a probability that, that that's your wallet associated with it. Um, yeah. Well, what, what do you think of that? Do, do you think that's an accurate take or? That's right. That's right. I think in a hyper Bitcoinized economy, what you're going to have is really the proliferation of DEXs or distributed exchanges that are running, hopefully, like you said, open source software that allow people to you know, interchange with one another. And there is not going to be a need for a legacy strangled exchange because, well, you can do everything that you want to do within that look within those localized economy where those people themselves don't care about all of the weight that comes with what chain analysis might reveal, what blacklist or whitelist things have been on, you know, whether it's Virgin coin or whether it's been passed around for a long period of time, because it's simply the ability to transact that wins over, right? So there's definitely a big potential for that as things continue to push from the regulatory side of things where everybody just kind of goes into a, I don't want to call it a gray market, but effectively that's what it would be a gray market, a gray market economy, right? So a, a good parallel to this is cash, but imagine you are, you know, sitting somewhere in, again, let's take Vancouver, right? You have a home and you want to sell your lawnmower. While you're selling your lawnmower, you have the opportunity to sell it on Facebook, right? Uh, Facebook marketplace or you have an opportunity to sell it to your neighbor with a garage sale for cash. Well, if you're gonna be selling it via Facebook marketplace, very clearly that's connected to your real life identity. That's also then connected to a lot of tax reporting infrastructure. And from that perspective, you are part, part of the system if you're transacting through Facebook marketplace. But if you go and you sell it for cash, well, that's kind of cash in your pocket, technically speaking, Right. And this goes for waiters as well. This goes for tipping culture in North America. Technically speaking, those things should be tax reportable. You should go and report it on your next tax return. But the reality of the situation is that a lot of people don't because it's not a significant amount, amount of money to warrant the amount of work that is required to kind of put it into the system. And that's what I would like to call more or less the gray economy. So I think that Bitcoin will function very similarly in this capacity 
with decentralized exchanges, really facilitating the liquidity if one needs to jump from kind of one ecosystem to another. Yeah, as well, like it's um, like I do all this stuff is obviously theoretical. So like, who knows how it's going to play out? But like, you hear a lot of people harp on Twitter, how like you know, you know the real kind of what would you call it? ultra hardcore Bitcoin maximalist takes where, you know, one Bitcoin does not equal one Bitcoin in that you, your Bitcoin is only, you know, it should always be no KYC because in the future there's going to be a marketplace between, you know, clean, no, there'd be a market, a separate marketplace between no KYC Bitcoin and KYC Bitcoin. And there could maybe be divergent prices based on that. Whereas like, to be honest, I don't know, does, is that ever really going to hold that kind of thinking? Because in my mind, one Bitcoin is one Bitcoin. And even still, so even if Europe comes out and says that, you know, this Bitcoin here, or this amount of Bitcoin is bad. If that person can, then has the ability to take off and just move to say like, I don't know, Brazil or El Salvador or anywhere and just spend it. And then those people take it as if they don't care because there is no regulatory regimes there then that just breaks Europe's regulatory system um, and kind of, just, and it just makes it so unworkable with time that the, the, the regime, the regulatory regime to try and box this technology into the old rails just falls under its own weight. Um, yeah. What, what do you think of that? Do you think that's. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very similar to maybe what's happening with cash but with Bitcoin, you obviously have the ability, like you said, to pick up and leave a jurisdiction. So when you're looking at cash transactions, you can say one US dollar in cash equals one US dollar in cash. Or you can argue that one US dollar in cash does not equal one US dollar in cash because go try to anywhere in the United States buy a home for cash right now. You can't. They literally, they, you walk into a bank with $400,000, they will send you right out the door and go, sorry, we're not going to do no, seriously, seriously. I know. Uh, you know. On top of that, you have all the war on cash in terms of it spreads COVID and all of the other stuff that's that's associated with that. But fundamentally, you could pose that argument and then say, well, one US dollar in cash does not actually equal one US digital dollar. I'm not talking about CBDCs, but I'm talking about one dollar in your bank account. The reason being is because who accepts it? And I think you hit the nail on the head with uh, Bitcoin in particular, wherein there's always going to be a location in the world uh, that is able to accept that transaction and continue to get you what you want. And at that time, you really have jurisdictional arbitrage going on. If EU starts to really crack down in this particular scenario, you will see a lot of people that have Bitcoin wealth flee to other nations, where wherever they're treated best, right? Um, it's, it's a very game theoretical approach to how these things will unfold. One of the other interesting things is that you start to see countries, for example, like Dubai, and the, the UAE, sorry, not countries, cities like Dubai and the UAE really starting to open up. And I'm not talking about from a regulatory standpoint, but I'm talking about from a transactional standpoint to what you can do with Bitcoin and, for example, with cash. I didn't know this until I actually visited Dubai for the first time myself last year, that you can buy a house in Dubai with cash, the U.S. dollars. You can go with a briefcase, you know, with two, three, four, five million dollars to a real estate agent, and they will be more than happy to take your money. So, you know. These types of things will exist and do exist today in the quote unquote cash economy. And I, I don't doubt that it'll be the same thing in the Bitcoin economy in the future. Yeah, I suppose like the real, for anyone interested in like, well, pondering more on this line of thought, like that book, The Sovereign Individual is just all kinds of, you know, externalities with what could happen with regards to Bitcoin being money even though it was written before Bitcoin even existed, but um, it's, it's more or less bang on the mark. So yeah, yeah, all good stuff. Um, but um, just, just something then, because I was, beforehand I was thinking about it because of your, um, you know, Russian background and you see a lot of the, the hardcore Bitcoin takes on Twitter, which to be honest, not a lot of, but you know, you have a lot of kind of, you know, the Bitcoin Maximus takes might be, or the real hardcore guys is that they kind of take the opinion of total polar opposite of whatever the media is pushing. So the media is pushing at the moment, you know, okay. the back. Yes. Sorry. Yeah, I, I lost you at uh, Russia bad. Yeah. So like, I, I just suppose like 
what's your take be like being originally from russia i know you haven't lived there in a long time like what's what's your take on that whole situation do you do you think it's accurate or what yeah i mean this this goes into politics in a, in a much broader realm than perhaps just bitcoin itself i i, I firmly believe that there is well, first, let's address kind of this polarity, right? You said Bitcoin maximalists like to take the opposite view of the mainstream media. Um, then, okay, what is the opposite view of the mainstream media? You can kind of look at the alt media space, right? What do they purport to say? A lot of those people say, you know, Putin's really trying to save the country. He's focused on nationalism and he's bringing prosperity to their people, which on the one hand can be argued because even through the sanctions that have been going on, Russia's economy has bounced back relatively, you know, relatively well uh if you just talk about it from the currency aspect um and internally they're they're mass producers of food as well as raw materials and goods so their economy doesn't really suffer too much from sanctions as a result uh whether you can use that as an argument to kind of say that you know from the alt-right uh, i should say alt right from the alt media space and yeah, putin's actually do good at doing well um i think that's a bit of a stretch so my overall opinion is that Honestly, Russia and those people that are operating Russia, and notice I don't say Putin because it's a very similar structure to what's going on in the United States, what's going on uh, in Germany, EU, Israel, I mean, China as well. It's a amalgamation of supranational interests that are actually operating the trajectory of those countries and those of economies. There's, there's a really interesting podcast uh, it's called germ warfare. And there was a gentleman on it recently that talked about the Bilderberg group. And he introduced this concept of supranational interests or supranational corporations that effectively are the ones that are really trying to move the trajectory of a global government. And that global government, you can see its tenants start to spill out onto the world economic forum, the bank of international settlements. If you look at the history of how that was formed uh, by the bilat the trilateral commission or bilateral commission, I forgive the, uh, me not remembering the name, but anyways, if you look into all of those things, the reality is, is that one individual nation, one individual country is not really better than the other. They're all the same. They're all trying to do the same thing because they're all effectively beholden to the same agenda uh, that we kind of see creeping through CBDCs that we currently see creeping through the biosecurity paradigm. Uh, what we see with kind of the elimination of individual freedoms and financial sovereignty. So that's to say that Putin is really the good guy or the bad guy. Um, he's neither. He's just a different flavor of what we are currently experiencing from a global unifying push for a global economy and a global government. If you look at the details in Russia, some of the strictest restrictions when it comes to COVID and vaccination policies were in Russia. So when people say, hey, you know, he's completely different. No, he's not. He's doing the same thing. Now, how people complied with that and how businesses and everybody, other organizations treated it, that's a different story. That kind of boils down to Russian culture, how it was formed, the legal systems and everything else that kind of operates there. So if you were in Russia, you might have not necessarily even noticed that. But from a judicial standpoint, from a you know top down oppressive perspective, it was exactly the same. In fact, even worse. So. Rounding all of this out, <clears throat> I don't take sides in this multipolar world that we're entering in because I think that everybody is just a different flavor of bad. <laughs> there's, very, there's very few countries that stand out to me as trying to do something different and trying to fight against this regime. And it's very difficult to do. So from that perspective, you know, being kind of a Russian myself, I realized that I am a nationless individual, meaning that I learned that I no longer can give my full faith to any one country for the foreseeable future because things are just so dynamic and things are changing so often, yet moving towards the same ultimate narrative that for me, my life is consisted of jurisdictional arbitrage. If I'm not able to live a free life in Canada, then I'm going to look for a jurisdiction when I can do that. If that jurisdiction no longer becomes viable, then I'm going to be going somewhere else. And I've kind of structured my family and everything else around my life to be able to live and operate in that reality. The, the best term that I can kind of coin it as a global citizen. The earth, the earth is my nation. <laughs> 
and wherever I'm treated for the best, that's where I'm going to go. And have you had to like, with, with regards to conscription or anything like that, have there been, have you been requested or is that a thing if you're not living outside, if you're outside so Russia? So I'm, I'm not too sure with the logistics of the conscription. I do know recently that they just tried to push out another 500,000 people to join. I don't know when it's going to come into effect, uh, but uh, our co-founder, uh, he does live in Russia, so he's dealing with this personally. And yeah, it's 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 a big issue. For me, it's not um, because I left Russia when I was very early and I never received what is known as a military passport. So uh, in Russia, you have to serve in the military once you turn 18, I believe. And if you don't, the only other way that you can kind of get out of that is go to university. But in university, you still have to attain that kind of paperwork saying that, yes, I did this instead of this, and this is lodged in um, the ministry there. So because I don't have that, I'm technically not registered in that system on that radar. So there is no threat of me in that particular area uh, when it comes to conscription. Whether or not that would change if I re-entered Russia, I don't know. I, I'm honestly not really well versed in, in those types of things. I would have to speak with an immigration lawyer and uh, see what their take on it is. But I do know that after the age of 35 or 28 or something like that, um, they're a lot less likely to, to force you to do those types of things. But I have been hearing stories that some doctor, you know, in some city in Siberia, he was like 42, he got conscripted. I know people with friends and family that are working, you know, and have served already their time that have, have befallen to this. So it's definitely a real threat. And a lot of people that I know from my parents' side, uh, which obviously we have relatives still in Russia, they have fled. They have fled because they see that this is a threat to their personal freedoms and you really don't want to be put in the front of any conflict, right? <laughs> Whether it's just or unjust, the point is, is that you're going to have lead flying at you. <laughs> and that's not really a good place to be, no matter how you spin it. Yeah, yeah. No, that's that's very interesting. Um, thanks for sharing. But I, I suppose we're, just to pivot that back to Bitcoin, and it kind of maybe should have been asked earlier on, but um, the... Yeah, in relation to like what you're saying about like the global interests, um, I'm often a little bit skeptical of when people talk about Bitcoin game theory and they say that like, you know, each nation is going to be acting in its own, um, you know, interest and win out that way. Now, I, I probably agree with the overall, you know, the overall consen or consensus of what they're what they're trying to say there. But I've often wondered, like, you know, you, you often like take you'd have Bitcoin Archive or Bitcoin Magazine come out with a headline on Twitter and say that you know Russia considering Bitcoin as an international payment um, mechanism to circumvent sanctions. Like, do you, like do you think Russia is kind of truly standing alone from? Well, you kind of indicate that maybe not, but like say when people talk about Bitcoin game theory. You'd often hear banded around like, you know, Russia and China are the two big ones that are outside of the, the US Western framework. Do you think they're more in line with the kind of the, you know, the UN, the West global interest than people might think? Or do they truly stand alone and operate under their own kind of paradigm? So they, I don't believe that they truly stand alone and operate on their own paradigm. I mean, you, you have this new phrase that's really being thrown around is a multipolar world, right? The unipolar world was effectively everybody under the US dollar and the, the hegemony of the Bank of International Settlements um, and the IMF as well. Uh, whereas now you start to see the BRIC countries, uh, Russia included China, uh, India, start to form their own economies uh, when they're talking about trade of oil, when they're talking about trade of uh, just raw goods. And they're doing that for the sake of survival. Right, just to be able to continue to operate their own internal economies. Uh, zooming out a little bit higher, right, and, and the reason why I think this question is, is rather difficult to answer, of whether or not they're specifically utilizing Bitcoin to kind of stand alone and fight against these, these oppressive measures uh, when you talk about sanctions, is because the way that I look at the world order, and I'm not talking about like the world order as an Illuminati, but just the way that the world works and the world fu and the world functions, the people that are in power and the people that are in charge is very similar to a mafia. <clears throat> so a mob. Uh, if you look at the old kind of, you know, Goodfellas and everything else, 
you had a lot of different families, right? All those families, they had their own expertise. These guys were really good bootleggers. The other guys were really good at racketeering. The other guys were good at brothels and everything else. They all had kind of did something that benefited their own specialties and their own resources that they would find within their own families. So they came together, but they all had different ways to go about enforcing their rule of law. And oftentimes you had one family who didn't agree with what the other family was doing. And then there would be infighting, there would be conflict, there would be sanctions, there would be murders, there would be war, right? So if you kind of take this model and you expand it on a much broader scale, when instead of families, you have these supranational interests that are located in various geographical regions, they're all striving for the same thing, which is really kind of to retain their power structure and to impose more control upon the population. If you look at it from that perspective, I think Bitcoin is just a means to an end and not really even Bitcoin, but more so stable coins. Stable coins have been the arbitrage unit of choice when you're talking about moving money from one location to another, simply because there's no volatility risk. So if you have a producer that's located, say, you know, in Beijing and they want to buy some Russian pork, it's very difficult for them to transact because, well, you, uh, U.S. kicked Russia off of SWIFT. So they're no longer able to be able to transact in that way. And some companies have been utilizing stable coins to conduct that trade. Um, so from that perspective, again, I, I think they're, they're, my answer to that question would be is no, they're not really standing on their own against uh, this Western hegemony. I think that they're just utilizing the tools that they have effective within their means to continue to conduct the business in the areas of speciality that they do have. And this is causing a rift. Right. This is causing the formation of the brick, uh, the bricks kind of infrastructure. So from that perspective, they all want to do the same thing, in my opinion, which is a press, but they're just doing it in slightly different flavors. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, that's a good answer. Um, so, yeah, I suppose just to pivot a little bit, maybe into more specific Bitcoin stuff. Um, but like you, you wrote a popular article for Bitcoin magazine called The Inevitability of Bitcoin Supremacy. And it's all based around the idea that Bitcoin is just a black hole and that like no matter what people do or how they try and stop it, um, it just sucks everything in. Um, yeah. Do you want to talk a little bit around that and just like why, why you think it is a, is, is a black hole? Yeah, absolutely. So the, the article, I think, was published in summer of 2021, if I'm not mistaken, and has uh, a couple of core tenants, uh, several main tenants. So basically, the, the technical aspects and the brilliance of what Bitcoin is. And Bitcoin is, uh, in my opinion, from a technical perspective, a discovery rather than an innovation. And I've heard this echoed by several people as well, uh, in, in the sense that all the technologies that Bitcoin incorporated, when you're talking about a distributed ledger, when you're talking about the, the proof of work mechanism, um, when you're talking about, again, the consensus mechanism and other elements of it existed before Bitcoin, uh, cryptography, right? SHV 256 uh, algorithms. But the brilliant thing was the amalgamation of all of those in one unifying system and bootstrapping it with a very well organized incentive structure, right? And that's kind of when Gary game theory starts to come in to make it really censorship resistant, to make it very viral in terms of its growth and adoption, to make it secure, of course, uh, which kind of comes hand in hand with the uncensorability and to be able to run the whole system without any intermediaries, the distributed aspect of it. So I think that the brilliance of, of Bitcoin formed that discovery of sound money. Right. And, and you can only discover something once. Right. There's no L just because LTC came out, Litecoin came out after the fact. It's not like they discovered a new form of money. Sound money existed and became into fruition with Bitcoin as a result, again, of all these kind of technical elements. Uh, and as a result, and this kind of brings to the second tenant of, of that article is the fundamental value of Bitcoin is really based on providing and giving individuals financial sovereignty. One of the most important things to be able to have with a sound money or an economic system, in my opinion, is the ability of individuals to freely transact with one another and the ability of them to hold their own money, being their own banks. And while this comes with certain risks, risks and this is something that you know, obviously isn't 
comfortable for everybody, but those that do start to realize the advantages that it holds for them as individuals and the resilience that it provides them over the long run. And this kind of translates to the, the third aspect of, of the article and the kind of general thought of Bitcoin as a black hole is the capacity of Bitcoin to be able to move wealth through time. Um, because Bitcoin is a deflationary currency and because of the fact that it is uncensorable and it is very fungible, you're able to take the money that you earn today and still access it in the future without having to worry or concern that somebody locked your account, say, and you know, <clears throat> I'll kind of make a bit of a tangent here to what happened in Canada. Say you supported a truckers rally, right? A rally for, for freedom, um, if one can describe it that way. Well, you did that and all of a sudden your bank accounts got shut down. You were, you were there physically present and you were supporting the movement. Your bank account got shut down. All of that money that you hope to move from the last two, three years of working at your job into the next 10 years is gone. So you had no ability to move wealth through time. You had no ability to save. You had no ability to continue to retain access to your funds. And I think all of these elements kind of combined from the technical brilliance of it to the fundamental value of financial sovereignty and to be able to move wealth through time is really what people need to survive kind of the shifting sands that we are living in today when it comes to the modern economy and survive and kind of what survive the, the next five, 10 years of what's going to happen with the possible, well, already introduction of CBDCs in certain nations, whether it's success is going to happen or not, that's a different argument altogether. Um, but Bitcoin then naturally becomes that instrument of escape from the system of control, surveillance, and, you know, again, I say uh, freedom oppression or oppression of freedom. And that's kind of really what makes it black hole in that when people start to realize that this is the way that their life is moving, they're going to search for alternatives because that's just what human beings do. Human beings are very adaptable to their environment. And I think that's one of the reasons why we survived as a species for so long, for 400,000 years or something like that is uh, the biological homo sapien, homo sapien. So <clears throat> from that perspective, uh, if you really look at where these things are going and where natural adoption might come in where Bitcoin really starts to increase its gravitational force to, to kind of the retail side is I always kind of give this example. So say you are living in a city, you're, you're living in these, one of these 15 minute cities. If your listeners haven't uh, come across that concept, I highly suggest you take a look at it. It's just, it's, it's a shit storm in the UK right now about all, what they're trying to do with 15 minute cities and in France and in other areas. This pilot project is just complete shit fuckery, but anyways, I digress. And if you were living in one of these 15 minute cities, you have a carbon allowance for the week that's sitting in your digital wallet that has been given to you by your central bank. And within that central, uh, central issuing authority, you have been issued a certain amount of stipend for the month called your UBI. And again, all of these elements have already been in place in various different areas in Canada's UBI has been tested with CERB. Uh, carbon credits, if you look at just any online uh, booking service for a flight, look, they have the carbon expenditure already there. You have a credit card in the United States that's basically carb calculating your carbon impact uh, through your purchases. So these systems are already functional and already in place. It's just a matter of getting them together. So now imagine, again, all of these are rolled into one and you're going to a shop and you want to buy some coffee. Like, oh man, you know, I'm not craving my caffeine fix. You whip out your phone or you whip out whatever it is to pay. You tap it. And then it says, I'm sorry, we cannot complete this transaction because you have reached your carbon credit allowance for this week. Please go and either buy more or we're going to have to decline this transaction. Well, you don't have any money. You kind of already priced out of the market for a house. It's, it's difficult to find a job. You're sitting on this, uh, this stipend of UBI and you're really pissed because you can't buy coffee. And then all of a sudden you look over your shoulder and then there's another guy and another merchant and he goes and he buys his coffee frictionlessly. frictionlessly. So, you, you know, you go to him and be like, hey, man, like, dude, how'd you, how'd you get your coffee? I know you, we, we, you and I were both sitting on the same UBI. We're both getting the same amount of, you know, carbon allowance. We're not rich. We're not flying on private jets. And, you know, uh, what's, what's, what's going on? He's like, oh, man, yeah, I just use Bitcoin. Yeah, my carbon, my, my carbon credited uh, CBDC allowance ran out. So I'm using Bitcoin because I want more coffee. That at that point in time, that guy's going to realize, go, wait a second. I see why I need this. 
I want coffee. I want meat. I want X. I want Y. And that's when you're really going to have the black hole just start just going on hyperdrive, hyper Bitcoinization, and everything's starting to get into and sucked into that ecosystem. And I, I do hope that that is, you know, I'm wrong and that this assumption is, is that's how it's going to function. But that's actually one of the scenarios where hyper Bitcoinization does happen sooner rather than later. Because it seems, I, I still agree with the fact that it is inevitable, but where I may slightly differ in from when I originally uh, created that piece to when it is today is how quickly will that happen? Um, at this point in time, I, I really feel that there is a lot of things that might force it to happen much sooner rather than later. Yeah. Well, I think that, yeah, so it's kind of like, it's almost something that seems so unbelievable um, that like it's beggar's belief and that a lot of people just think that can never happen. But like, they, if you read oh, any we, of we like- We also thought that we'd never be locked in our house for two years. <laughs> I know that, I know I totally agree with you, but like if you, if you listen to, like, if you just listen to what any of these people are saying, like, you know, the global, like, you know, the World Economic Forum, the global leaders, like, it, and to your point, like, a lot of the carbon credit stuff, these 15 minute cities, like, these pilot projects, same as CBDC pilot projects that a lot of people are aware of. Like, this is the intention that these people, the establishment status quo, do want it to go. It just remains to be seen will they be able to pull it off or not? And if they do pull it off, then like, t to your point, like I think that Bitcoin could just go, you know, none of that stuff can be a state on Bitcoin, like, so it would just be a, a zoom yeah, for and adoption. And that's a very big question of whether or not they'll be able to pull it off or not. Um, I think it was in Nigeria that they adopted CBDCs, don't quote me on this, last year, somewhere sometime very recently. And literally half a percent of the entire population adopted it, half a percent, and they were not having any of it. And just recently, I guess now it'd be going on maybe three weeks ago, they turned about face and said, okay, you know, we're actually going to be moving to legalize Bitcoin and cryptocurrency transactions. CBDC is gone. And that's clearly a failed experiment on their end. They, they saw how it's not going to work. So will these people be able to instill these types of structures all over the world in a unified fashion? I think it's going to be very, very difficult, but it's certainly not out of the realm of possibility. Yeah. So look, that, that remains to be seen, but like, and to your point, you mentioned it as well, but, um, like when did, is it, you know, like Bitcoin is, that's kind of what I touched on, on on your podcast a couple of weeks ago, but, um, just talking about, you know, like Bitcoin is the only financial asset that is say like we're, we're going into the increasingly unstable world at the moment in many kind of ways. Um, a lot of the, you know, power structures in global geopolitics are starting to break and things are starting to change economies. We're coming to the end of like a long-term debt cycle. Um, who knows what's going to happen? Like how, how long do you think people realize that Bitcoin, it, cause it's the only asset that you can take the only financial asset that you can take counterparty risk directly yourself and just be isolated from, you know, all of them, any madness that happens anywhere. Like how long do you think that will be become obvious to even people in traditional finance, considering your, your background there? Uh, that, I don't have a crystal ball in front of me. I wish I did. <laughs> um, but you know what? It, and this maybe is a bit of a pessimistic, take on it, but I don't think that people will really realize this, the value, the opportunity, and the freedom that something like this provides until it's too late. So let's talk about the average person. You know, the average person needs to be put in that chokehold before they realize the one that I described, before they realize that there's value in something like this for them personally. Other than that, they're just gonna take the mainstream or argument or if not the mainstream, just really focus on the speculative asset aspect of such assets uh, like Bitcoin. Whereas from the institutional side, right, there is less need for them to jump into such an ecosystem quickly because they are beholden to a lot of red tape would be probably the best way to say it without going into too much minutia. 
of interacting with these types of ecosystems. So, but, but what do I mean by kind of red tape at the very high level? Uh, let's look at micro strategies. So I recall Sailor having a conversation, I forget on which podcast, and they asked him about, so, you know, can you tell us about the process that it took for micro strategies to put Bitcoin on their balance sheet? And he goes off, let me tell you this story. And I'll paraphrase it, but effectively he goes up to his board and says, okay, guys, so first question that I want to ask everybody here is, do you know what Bitcoin is? Everybody raises their hand. Okay, good, good. I don't have to go into that detail. Great. All right, next question. How many people here own Bitcoin? About three quarters of the room, hands go up. He goes, okay, okay, good, good. So what do you guys think about putting Bitcoin on our treasury? Who would agree? Almost no hands go up. And then, why? You guys, you guys own it, right? You not believe in it. I mean, you must because you have it personally. Why not for the company? And his effective answer to that was it, it didn't matter about their personal beliefs. It mattered everything about how they had to then take the reporting requirements of having Bitcoin on their balance sheet, what the accounting principles, the, G, the GAP, uh, generally accepted accounting principles would be utilized. Did they even exist in order to be able to do mark to market and all of the other elements that you needed as a public company to disclose Bitcoin on your balance sheet? Furthermore to that, uh, Bitcoin itself as an asset on a corporate balance sheet, you also need to do uh, what is known as rebalancing, right? So in a corporate treasury, you are uh, usually by the board of directors stand out, set out certain mandates that say, okay, 10% of your treasury has to be always in cash or cash equivalents. The other 90% can be this, or the other 80% can be this, the other 10% can be that, and so on and so forth. But because Bitcoin is, you know, in the long run, an appreciating asset, what you have to do every single quarter, or depending again on their jurisdiction, is to rebalance that to make sure that that mix stays the same. So say they bought Bitcoin originally at 10,000, Bitcoin doubled to 20,000. Well, if their allocation of their entire treasury was mandated at 10%, then they value that in US dollars, which means that they now have to sell in order to go back to that 10%. Because as a total collection of their entire treasury, Bitcoin valued at 20,000 takes up as a percentage much more than it did at 10,000. So you always have to do these different uh, operations, right, in the back office to be able to maintain it. Then you couple that with the regulatory complexity and the accounting complexity of all of this and the fact that then you have to get all this audited and audited auditors right now are running for the hills <laughs> as a result of FTX. And even prior to that, it was very difficult to find an, a company to audit a, a quote unquote crypto business. So long story short to that is to say that their interests right now as corporations, as institutions are not actively involved in seeking this type of asset class uh, for the pure ethos that, you know, that we believe it to have. Um, because all of those other barriers stand in their way. Now, if all of those barriers were to suddenly disappear and then you had a much larger uh, kind of growing incentive to do that. So for example, you know, let, let's take what we talked about in the sanctions, you know, between Russia and you needed to continue to buy the raw goods to continue your manufacturing operation and keep the business afloat. Well, then it's like, okay, does the business continue to operate, uh, utilizing you know this other type of system even though all of those complexities we probably are not going to be able to really do but we're just going to say fuck it or does the business close and then that's kind of a between a rock and a hard place decision that institutions have to make and most of them they don't want the business to close so they will be forced to go through all of those uh, to cut through all of that red tape whether successfully or not you know that's the tbd but they will at least try it. but for the time being i don't think that they're really too incentivized to jump in it head over heels um, outside of this, just again, like I mentioned from a purely speculative and a very, very guarded perspective. So all of this to say, I don't think it's gonna be as quick uh, from an institutional side as people make it out to be because of all of these barriers. And from a personal side, also, I don't think it's gonna be as quick as people make it out to be because the average person really, really needs to have their airway cut off <laughs> before they make drastic changes like that and, and hop into a completely different world that they may not be familiar with. Yeah, look, as, as my friend Mark says, he says most people, you know, need to touch the stove, the hot stove and get burnt. You know, if you tell them not to do it, they'll just, <laughs> most just do it anyway. 
and like teaching a child. But um, yeah, so like I just suppose, well, look, if there's a situation where like what happened in crypto and um, say cr crypto in the past, you know, six months, if that was to actually happen in the traditional finance system where you had like, you know, the money printer wasn't working anymore, you know, wasn't fulfilling the role it has in the past and like there's total faith being lost and you just had huge fractional reserve banks going bust. You think they would hopefully get it pretty fast then that they can just, you know, whatever assets they have, they can just hold outside of everything with Bitcoin. But I don't know. Who knows? Maybe they all need to get like wrecked first. Um, who knows? You know, it's, it's, it's funny that you say that, but uh, in, in 2008, uh, during the great financial crisis, you had what, you know, they kind of called the liquidity crunch. Uh, liquidity crunch is pretty similar to what you're describing in that the overnight lending facilities, the repo facilities, they broke down. So large businesses wouldn't, weren't able to lend overnight and fill their obligations. So effectively, they lost access to that money printer. And that literally almost ended the entirety of the global financial system. It was only through bailouts and it was only through injections of mass amounts of liquidity into these overnight markets that the system just continued to hobble along. So the next time this happens, you, you literally, you cannot do the same type of injection because it will ruin the economy so badly. And, and I'm not talking about the real economy. I'm talking about this kind of, uh, so I don't, I don't want to introduce too many concepts toward, towards the end of this conversation, but there's the retail economy and there's the wholesale economy. The retail economy is the real economy. It's the one that you and I transact and it's the one where you go buy a coffee or and get a ride um, in, in a taxi cab. The wholesale economy is all of the overnight lending facilities, the, uh, the repo facilities. It's the economy that exists simply in a purely digital manner between the central banks and other constituents within the system uh, and the lending kind of counterparties that exist between them. So <clears throat> from this perspective, they themselves, if they were to go into this type of situation at this point in time, would not be able to continue to escape through injecting liquidity and printing money because the wholesale economy itself would not be able to take it. And as a result, the retail economy would actually cease to function. So they would destroy the only levers of power that they kind of have left. And that's why we met between a rock and a hard place when you talk about global macro um, economics. And that's why I really think they're pushing for CBDCs because it's the only way that I see to be able to rein in and kind of push the can down the road because then you're going to able to really finitely or uh, really minutely control the wholesale money economy. And with that, you might, you know, be able to buy yourself five, 10, 15, I don't know how many more years. So yeah, we'll see. <laughs> Yeah, super interesting. So look, I, I just know we're coming up on time here. So just, um, yeah, two more questions, uh, that might, uh, you might be, uh, have some, some thoughts on. So, yeah. So like in your opinion, like just, I kind of asked this to everyone that like, turns to Bitcoin, like, what do you think that could, cause I don't think there are any, well, I don't think there are any sure things in the world. Like <laughs> maybe Bitcoin might be the closest thing to a sure thing. And I know that's kind of the argument you're making in that article, but like what, what could happen? Like what threats do you see that could, is there anything that concerns you that could maybe, you know, destroy Bitcoin or stop this, this hyper Bitcoinization? Uh, yeah. So, and, and this may be not a very popular opinion, but I very much do believe that Bitcoin has already been usurped. Um, and for that reason, it's not going to be going away. I won't get into the semantics and details of how it came about to be that way, um, but I will simply say that all of the money that has been flowing around, all of the trillions of dollars that have been missing from the US accounting books, uh, if you look at, I think it's FASB 66, if I'm not mistaken, it, it, something like that. But anyways, it, it was a change in the way that the government had to report their accounting standards to um, their books to the public, effectively creating two sets of books. There were the real books and then there were the public books. So as a result, there was a huge amounts of money that went missing and funneled into you know kind of various black projects and, and initiatives. All that money is effectively taken and created out of nothing. 
meaning that you are actually taking the value of real people's contributions, their hard work, their energy, and their time, and then you're usurping it through the ability to effectively infinitely print money and then hide this money uh, to be able to do whatever is necessary. This, as a result, created a problem for the people that are the closest to the money printer, right? Think of the Cantillian effect. How do we retain our value through time? With we know that these pieces of paper aren't going to hold their value over time. And even in the future, maybe assets such as land or other hard assets might not be around because something changes in the regulatory structure. So how do we take all of this wealth that we've stolen and how do we keep it to ourselves? How do we retain ownership of it? How do we retain our financial sovereignty? Oh, look at this thing, this, this thing called Bitcoin. Oh, that's pretty interesting. Well, I, I think if we move it to really a savings mechanism and a way to store value over time and push, you know, kind of the block debate in one way or the other, then we can get a really good way to take all of the money that we usurped and actually hide it and be, and not hide it as in, you're not gonna see who owns what, but keep it and retain it to ourselves. So from that perspective, uh, it seems to me that Bitcoin is not gonna go anywhere because they need it. <laughs> they need a way to be able to store their wealth through time, through the next decade, through the next hundred years. And Bitcoin is the only solution that I see out there that is less prone to a coerced attack because the cost of that attack is continuing to increase with every single block that's mined. Uh, so from that perspective, right, um, I think kind of a good take on this would be um, that Bitcoin is assured because of its necessity to the actual people that are looking to destroy the current economic regime <laughs> because of its uh, current faults. And again, I, this is not a popular opinion. Um, and I know a lot of people may not want to believe, but early on, and I'll, I'll just kind of end with this early on, that was one of the biggest questions that I had again, being in the space since, since 2012, I was like, okay, something like this is so powerful. It can change so many lives. And you're telling me that a government that has an unlimited budget that can run and do wars thousands of miles from when they're located, cannot blow up a couple of power plants, cannot buy out or Jeffrey, Jeffrey Epstein, you know, Lolita Island, all of these owners of these miners, uh, and then print into infinity a certain amount of capital to be able to do a 51 attack. Like, come on, like, eh, you can't do that. I just have a hard time believing it. So in my opinion, if that hasn't happened, then they allow it to exist kind of like Tor. Uh, so Tor, um, was, was it created by, by the Navy originally, right? The onion protocol, if, if I'm not mistaken. And it's kind of like a cash 22, wherein the Tor protocol itself, if there's not enough relays in the network, then you have the high likelihood of your encrypted messages not being fully secured and encrypted. So you need more people on the network, but you also don't wanna give everybody the ability of, of you know uh, uh, encrypted conversation and data transfer. So it's like, you gotta release it a little bit to enough people to get the network effect so you can get your benefit from it, but you don't wanna bring it to the masses. And kind of, it's a very similar story, it seems with Bitcoin, it's kind of like, yeah, we gotta push it out there. We gotta make it you know, enough so that we can have enough assured security uh, and trans transactional immutability for ourselves, but we don't want everybody to have it because then, well, that's really not gonna do well for us. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's interesting, interesting answer. We could um, maybe go into that in a later podcast more sure. detail in the future, but um, yeah. So just just the last one then. Um, like what? So yeah, I asked this to everyone as well, but um, like, what do you think needs to? Is there anything that needs to be built at the moment on Bitcoin or around Bitcoin that isn't currently being built? In your opinion? Yeah, um, I wish I had uh, John, who's our lead engineer, to to answer this question because I think he'd have a really good. A um, couple of points to say. For me, I can't see anything that doesn't already exist in layer two solutions that needs to be built. There are a couple of fun and interesting projects that may really benefit the world as a whole, but I don't think that necessarily is a requirement for Bitcoin to continue to exist. So one of them is Noster, if you're familiar with that uh, and your audiences as well. Uh, if not, take a look at it and just Google it. It's pretty interesting concept, but effectively it, it would be one of the ways that you can decentralize social media altogether. 
uh, across the world and also be able to really retain the data authority um, of your information within those networks. And of course, the, the cross platform ability of then that type of messaging medium. So something like this, right, coupled with an uncensorable money, you have free, uncensorable free speech and uncensorable money all running kind of uh, in parallel with one another. And I think that's something that's powerful. So I would, again, just say that if, if there's something that needs to be built out is something like that is a, a really a means of uncensorable communication alongside with uncensorable money. And then those two together can really build a bright future for humanity. You know what? And like, I totally agree. That would be my go-to as well. Like, I know it's not Bitcoin exactly, but it's along similar lines than what, like a lot of people think that, you know, Musk being the savior of Twitter and kind of opening up what he sees is like, I just think that's total nonsense. And it'll just become, you know, the same problem that it was before, um, just with a different color on it. So yeah, super interesting. I'm actually hoping to have someone on to talk about Noster uh, pretty soon. So cool. yeah, yeah so send me that link once, uh, once that podcast is up, I'd be curious to listen to we'll it. Do. It's just, I think the problem is like, Everyone kind of knows about it, but no one really knows, knows about like, you know, the, the couple of guys that are working on it and they're just like pronged at the door at the moment with demands. So, yeah. um, but you yeah, know, I, I do think like once I, and I think Noster is that solution, but like, as long as it doesn't suffer from the, you know, the censorship or manipulation problems that Twitter does, then like, it's something that I think everyone can sort of get behind and should get behind. Unlike what, you know, you saw like, a lot of other decentralized, quote unquote, decentralized social networks or like, you know, free speech platforms that have just turned into, you know, like Gab or Getter or Parler or anything. And they're just all different spins on um, Twitter itself, but it doesn't actually solve the problem. It's just people want to entertain their own niche. So exactly. Yeah. It's the protocol level um, is this is where it needs to be solved. So yeah. Um, yeah, look, uh, thanks for coming on, Nick. It's a great conversation. So, like, just uh, a bit about Bitcoin Reserve. Like, what are you guys doing and where can people uh, find you? Yeah, uh, sure. So, Bitcoin Reserve, you can find us on most social media, LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, not so much, but we're still there. Um, at BTC Reserve HQ. That's the handle that you can just type in across all the socials and find us there. Uh, you can find us at uh, www.bitcoinreserve.com. And we really help people provide accessible OTC broker services. Uh, with a focus on privacy and a really hands-on approach um, with the way that we handle our client trades, uh, we'll handle communication and customer service. That's brilliant. Um, okay, thanks, Nick, and I hope to speak to you again at some point in the future. Likewise, Jack. It was a pleasure. Great conversation.